All right, everybody, welcome to the webinar today. Let me do a uh, quick little sound check here to make sure my voice is coming through. It looks like it is. Awesome. Um, I want to welcome you guys to the webinar. We're going to talk about using TypeScript with React and Redux. Um, TypeScript is a, a great language, especially for folks who are coming from a C Sharp or Java background. And uh, uh, React and Redux are, uh, are, are two wonderful libraries for basically building UIs and managing application state. So let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so um, we're going to go through a couple of slides. Um, I'm not a huge fan of slides, but I want to give you a little bit of introductory material so you can kind of get an idea of what we're going to talk about. So we'll do some slides for five to ten minutes. Then we're going to jump into some live coding for 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll take the last 15, maybe 20 minutes of time to actually answer any questions that you have. If you do have any questions, you'll notice in the webinar software that there's a place where you can type in those questions. If you type in the questions there, when we get to the question time, I'm going to switch back over to that screen, and I'll read those questions and do my best to, uh, to answer them for you. Uh, the session is going to be recorded, so um, later on after it's over, it'll be posted up on Wintelect's website, and you can actually go and download it, and you can review the material presented. Um, now, the material we're going to cover in this webinar is really a, it's really kind of a, an overview of what we're going to talk about in an upcoming class that we're going to be teaching on using TypeScript with um, React and Redux. And uh, it's going to be a two-day course, and we're going to um, not only be covering the TypeScript stuff, but also learning React and Redux. So if you're new to React or Redux or TypeScript and you're interested in learning more about it beyond this webinar, you can check out this class here. Um, when it happens in, uh, in February. I believe it's actually February 8th and 9th. Okay, so with that said, let's get back over here. All right, so TypeScript. The first question we want to ask ourselves is, what problem does TypeScript solve? All too often, we're too quick to jump into using a bunch of new technologies because it sounds cool or the other developers are using it, or we heard we were at some conference and somebody talked about how awesome some technology was. So we come back to our development team and we're like, we have to use this. Well, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. Instead, we want to understand the problem that our technologies are solving, and then we can make decisions about why we should use or not use those technologies. So the first question is, before even looking at TypeScript in terms of React or Redux, what problem does TypeScript really solve? So in order to answer that question, we first have to talk about JavaScript a little bit. JavaScript is cool, but hard. What do I mean by, by hard? JavaScript is not hard like writing assembly language code or doing low-level systems programming with C or something like that. JavaScript is very much a high-level language with many of the, uh, the usual data structures and capabilities and functionality that you would expect to find in a high-level language. So when we say JavaScript is hard, we don't, we don't mean like it's hard in, this, in that, in that lower-level technical sense. What we mean by JavaScript being hard is that when you start building larger applications with JavaScript, and, and maybe you're, you're just one developer on a larger team and you don't know all of the APIs or all of the capabilities or all of the details of all, all the different parts of the application, Working with JavaScript becomes hard because you don't necessarily understand what all the different objects and things in the application can do. And unless the code is really, really well documented um, or you just spend a whole lot of time kind of hunting and pecking around trying to figure out what's going on, using JavaScript can be very difficult. So in today's world where we're transitioning from this um, server-side web development to, um, to doing client-side web development. You know, kind of in the past when we talked about web development, people thought of, you know, PHP, uh, uh, Python, Java, C Sharp, whatever. But the truth is, when we talk about web development today, we're really talking about really doing all of our coding in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All of that server-side stuff is for building REST services, GraphQL services, what whatever type of, of service we're building to consume data from. When we talk about building web apps, we're really talking about JavaScript. Well, the problem is people who were formerly C-sharp and Java 
developers building web apps now have to transition over to this JavaScript world to start building these, um, these, these, these modern web applications. And the challenge with that is that when people transition over to JavaScript, they tend to, they tend to think that it's going to behave and act just like C Sharp or Java. But the truth is it doesn't. Because even though it's called JavaScript, JavaScript is a lot more like Lisp than it is Java. It's a functional programming language, not a classical object-oriented programming language. And, and that really throws people off because most people coming from C-sharp and Java are not familiar with functional programming languages in general, much less actually using a language like that to build applications. Another thing that is very difficult and challenging for folks when, um, when transitioning over is the um, loosely dynamically typed nature of JavaScript versus something that's strongly and statically typed. When you create a class or whatever in Java or C Sharp, that class has a certain predefined shape at development time. And you have to, to interact with that class according to that shape. So that predefined class shape would be like static typing. And strong typing means we have to interact with it in that way. Now, in JavaScript, though, everything is loosely and dynamically typed. Basically, types can change as, as things are being executed. Um, there is no static typing of properties and that kind of thing. You can kind of add properties and remove properties at will. It's very, very flexible. For a person coming from a C Sharp or Java background, this alone is, is one of the big stumbling blocks that they encounter when trying to work with JavaScript. So these are some of the frustrations and difficulties of working with JavaScript to build enterprise type applications. So while JavaScript is cool, JavaScript can also be hard, especially for those enterprise apps. So TypeScript comes to the rescue. First of all, the first thing we need to say is that all JavaScript is valid TypeScript. This is actually a really important concept. If anybody on, on the webinar has ever used um, uh, for, uh, CoffeeScript before, you'll know that having these other languages that transpile to JavaScript is nothing new. So we TypeScript transpiles to JavaScript, CoffeeScript transpiles to JavaScript. Um, you can use the Babel transpiler and its various plugins to transpile different syntaxes like JSX and stuff to JavaScript. So the transpiling, the, the, uh, the transpilation process is not new, but the concept that all JavaScript is valid TypeScript is extremely important. One of the reasons why CoffeeScript, I think, didn't become more popular long term was that you couldn't take your current uh, JavaScript application and simply run it with CoffeeScript. All right? Instead, you had to adapt your code to this new CoffeeScript syntax. Whereas with JavaScript, you can take a current JavaScript application, make it a TypeScript application, and it will just work. All right? So what that means is that basically you can take your existing JavaScript applications and switch them to TypeScript with really no changes at all. And then as you start to continue working on your application, you can start to introduce TypeScript into it. You know, one of the things that I, uh, when I was first learning about TypeScript many, many years ago, one of the things that kind of discouraged me at first from using it was I thought that everything in TypeScript always had to be strongly typed. I'm one of these people that actually loves JavaScript for what it is. And I love the fact that we can do you know, um, loose and dynamic typing with it. And so when I first heard about TypeScript and strongly typed JavaScript, I'm thinking, I don't know, I, it's actually taking away one of the features that I like about JavaScript. But what's cool about TypeScript is that you can add it to your JavaScript code really as much or as little as you want. If you want to make everything strongly typed, you can. If you want to make some things strongly typed, you can. You don't have to make everything strongly typed. In fact, TypeScript has a special type called any that basically allows you to declare something as any and then you can do whatever you want with it just like you would do in regular JavaScript. So one of the cool things about TypeScript is it's very friendly to, to migrating your project from JavaScript to TypeScript. Now, another cool thing about TypeScript is that TypeScript kind of hides some of the JavaScript script-ish 
concepts and things like that. What do I mean? You can code TypeScript just like JavaScript with the same um, thought, press, th thought processes and concepts and stuff like that if you want to. But TypeScript has a tendency to kind of push the developer to writing JavaScript applications that are really more like C Sharp or Java apps. So for example, the concept of coding to an interface. JavaScript has no concept of interfaces, but TypeScript does. Um, using classes in TypeScript, while ultimately TypeScript classes are really the same thing as ES2015 classes, when you code things with classes in TypeScript, you tend to think a little bit more along classical inheritance lines, even though underneath the hood, we all know it's actually prototype inheritance. But TypeScript is really good for people who are coming from C Sharp and Java because basically they get introduced to an environment that they're really already familiar with. Uh, probably the best example that I can give of this is the, the difference between teaching Angular 1 classes versus Angular 2 classes. When you teach Angular 1 classes, it's all straight up JavaScript and you think in a very JavaScript kind of way. And so not only are people having to learn Angular 1, which is difficult in and of itself, but most of those people don't really know JavaScript either, so now they're having to learn JavaScript. But when you teach Angular 2 classes, because you use TypeScript, believe it or not, the learning, the learning um, curve is actually much smaller because people just approach the TypeScript like they're doing C Sharp or Java programming. And it actually makes their life a lot easier and you spend a lot less time having to get mired into all the details of JavaScript. All that being said, you to still know JavaScript if you're doing Angular 2 programming, but TypeScript makes it easier to transition over to that. And then finally, the strong and the, yeah, the uh, strong and static typing. This is a lifesaver. Most people who come from a C sharp Java background are used to using really nice editors with really nice code completion and stuff like that. And while a lot of JavaScript editors do provide some type of IntelliSense or code completion, usually the suggestions they give you are guesses. Basically looking at your at your source code file and based upon your, your source code file kind of guessing at what your objects are capable of doing. But when you work with TypeScript you get really good IntelliSense. You get the type of IntelliSense like you get in a C Sharp or Java type of environment because it actually does know what your objects can do based upon the, uh, the, the actual uh, typing uh, typings to find for your various objects and things like that. All right. Now, TypeScript, even though we're going to talk about it within the context of React and Redux here, you can use it for all of your enterprise JavaScript projects. Um, it's not limited to a particular library or framework, that kind of thing. It's, it's, you can use it across the board. You can use it to build node applications. You can, you can, you can use it for any, any JavaScript um, type of project. Um, also, TypeScript works with a lot of editors. You can use uh, Visual Studio Code, which is what we'll be using in, in the class. You can use regular Visual Studio. You can use Atom and WebStorm and Sublime and editors like that. Um, all of them provide good code completion, and, and they're, they're really nice editors. Um, and then finally, it's perfect for very large projects because when you're working on a large project, you only typically know the one small piece of the pie that you're working on. And with TypeScript, you can get you can get really good IntelliSense and other things to understand how the rest of the project works when actually building it. All right, quick um, comment here on TypeScript versus ES twenty fifteen. So, when TypeScript was originally created, like like other transpilers like Babel and Tracer and stuff like that, TypeScript basically allowed you to use ES twenty fifteen code before ES 2015 um, became a standard. And so you could actually use the new class keyword and promises and stuff like that. And, and TypeScript would know how to take that code and transpile it back to ES5. And those other transpilers did, this, did the same thing. Um, however, however, modern browsers today largely support the vast majority of ES 2015 features. Really, the biggest, the biggest feature that's not supported is, are the ES2015 modules. So for example, if I wanted to use you know, JavaScript classes or I wanted to use 
um, destructuring or the spread operator, um, if I wanted to use uh, shorthand properties and stuff like that, most of those things are actually already um, supported in the web browser. So using TypeScript today, because you want to use ES2015, um, unless, unless you have to target old browsers, isn't necessarily required because the browsers themselves do support the ES2015 um, language itself. Or if all you wanted to do was support ES2015, you could use other transpilers such as Babel and things like that. However, when we talk about TypeScript today, we will mention some of those ES2015 features because TypeScript is going to transpile it for us. So today what we're going to be using TypeScript for is going to be the strong and static typing and specifically the ES2015 modules and then mentioning the other ES2015 stuff as well. All right, I want to mention something about flow here real quick. If you've probably done any type of Googling around for, um, for looking for uh, you know, static typing options when working with JavaScript applications, you've probably not only found TypeScript online, but you've probably also found something called Flow, all right? Now, Flow is a technology that was created by Facebook. So um, um, over the past several years, Facebook has basically taken a ton of their JavaScript um, libraries and then just made them all open source and available for the community to make use of. Um, when you start thinking about things like React and GraphQL and Relay and Jest and Immutable JS and Flow, you know, there's lots of stuff out there that really, when, when all put together, really comprises a full Facebook stack of technologies. So if you want to do a full Facebook stack of technologies, then you might not choose to use TypeScript. Instead, you might want to just go with regular JavaScript using Babel to transpile, but then how would you get static typing? Well, you can use a technology called Flow. Now, Flow is a little bit different than, um, than TypeScript. Both of them provide you the static and strong typing, but TypeScript's an actual full-blown language that transpiles to JavaScript. Whereas Flow basically is more of uh, type annotations, if you want to think of kind of decorating up your file with a bunch of type annotations, and then you, you run that file through the Flow binary. And the Flow program basically looks at your source code and then reports back any errors for stuff that's not matching what the type rules are, are defining. But, but when you go to actually transpile your code um, with Babel, you actually run a Babel plugin that simply removes the flow annotations. It doesn't, um, it doesn't like take the flow annotations and then produce new code from it. It just simply removes it from your code files. Um, from my research and looking into it, uh, TypeScript is kind of more of a full-blown solution for building JavaScript applications uh, that, that you know, are much more familiar to your Java C Sharp developers and transpiling code out to some type of, um, of final JavaScript app, whereas Flow tends to be really, really strong in the static typing, but that's really about all it does. It's not a, a full-blown language um, and provides a transpiler and stuff like that. Um, so if, you're, if your development team really wants uh, nothing but Facebook technologies on the web page, then Flow would be a good option. Otherwise, um, otherwise, TypeScript would be the way that I would choose to go. And I've used both, and I will tell you that TypeScript is easier to use. I find with Flow that I do a lot more fighting with, with, with the Flow types to get it to do the things that I want it to do. So I think, I think most development teams would find, you know, find it much easier to get up and running with the same benefits of using TypeScript. Okay. So, we're going to take a look at how TypeScript is going to transpile the ES2015 code, use the strong and static typing as it applies to React and Redux. Um, specifically here, the features we're going to look at, we're going to look at classes, interfaces, enums, property declarations, default parameters, um, access modifiers, typings, and types. And then um, on the React and Redux side, we're going to just take a look at how those various things um, uh, get used with the actual React and Redux libraries themselves. What's really cool with Redux is that Redux actually provides a strong typings file um, as part of the installation of Redux, whereas, whereas React, you have to install some external typings to get the strong typings for it. 
But uh, Redux basically works with TypeScript right out of the box, which is really awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We're going to get started by taking an existing React and Redux application, and we're going to implement the TypeScript in it. Um, I was going to use WebStorm as our editor, but I decided to switch back over to Visual Studio Code. I just really love Visual Studio Code. Nothing against the JetBrains folks, but, uh, but Visual Studio Code is a really awesome editor. And um, uh, I'm not going to be using Webpack. Um, typically, when I use React and, and Redux um, and ES 2015 and stuff, I'll use Webpack, and Webpack will actually launch my TypeScript um, compiler and, and do all the processing and stuff. But this is going to be a very simple project to simply just focus in on doing the TypeScript code with, with React and Redux. So we're simply just going to run the TypeScript compiler, have it do the compiling for us, and we're going to use System.js to actually load up our modules for us. And then we're going to use Browser Sync to serve up our web pages, and then we have, um, we're going to use JSON Server to basically serve up our REST service data. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with this. Okay, so I have my Visual Studio Code here, and let me zoom in a little bit. And we are going to take an existing application and make it work with TypeScript. Now, now at the moment, the application won't actually run um, because I basically took it, removed the TypeScript um, uh, code, and we're going to add it back in. And then once we actually add it back in, then any, everything will actually run and launch for us. So if you take a look over here, you're going to see that we have a JavaScript folder. And inside of here, we have a, a bunch of different files. We have a, an actions folder, a components folder, a folder for models and for reducers. And then in our top level folder, we have a bunch of action types defined. We have our main application file, and we have our app store. Now, you'll notice here, here that you'll see a TS, and then a JS, and then a map file for the JS. When you use something like a Webpack, you typically wouldn't output your JS and JS map file to the actual folder where your TS files are. Um, it's actually quite frustrating because you'll find yourself clicking on the JS files a lot to try to open them and edit them when really you should only be editing the TS files. Um, but because of the way we're approaching this project using system.js and just running the TypeScript compiler from the command line, um, we're going we're gonna to have all the files together. Now the TypeScript file, the TS file here, so we'll click on action types. We're going to take this file, for example, and we're going to convert it over to use the actual TypeScript stuff. So we're going to be modifying this slightly to make it more TypeScript-ish. In this particular case, we're going to change it to use enums. Now, when we change this file, this file will get transpiled ultimately out to this file here. So here's what our action and types file looks like when it's transpiled by TypeScript. Now, of course, working with this file and debugging it would be a real pain. So a map file is produced by the TypeScript compiler that's basically going to allow us to map our TypeScript code to our JS file here. And so when we load it up in the web browser, we'll actually be able to set our breakpoints and stuff inside of our TypeScript file while actually running the action types.js file that you see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with actually setting up this application to actually be able to use TypeScript. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to open up our models folder. In our models folder, we have this widget class that I've created. Now, in JavaScript, because um, uh, because the shape of objects can change as the program executes, it's common to have like a constructor function or to have various um, function properties or even getter setter properties defined on a class. But there is no actual, you know, uh, well, field definitions that you put on a class. They just don't really exist. You can set up your fields inside the constructor if you want or something like that, but in terms of like an actual like Java or C Sharp class where you might have a bunch of fields defined, um, or in the case of C Sharp, a bunch of properties, get or set of properties defined, you don't necessarily always do that in JavaScript. So what we can do is we can actually set this thing up though using TypeScript to actually have those actual fields. So we're gonna come into here 
and we're going to use something called a property declaration. So we're going to say public ID number. All right. And so now I have my public ID number, and that's going to be an actual strongly typed property that's going to exist on this on this widget class. And we'll add some additional ones as well. So we're going to say public uh, name string public description string and then public color string public um, size string and we'll say public quantity number so there we go now a couple of words here a couple of comments here about the the syntax TypeScript does support access modifiers. So you can use public, protected, and private. So here we've marked these as public. Um, these are the actual names of the properties. And then these are the types. Now, one of the things that you'll find, um, it'll take a little bit of time to get adjusted to when working with TypeScript, are these colons here. In JavaScript, when you're working with object literals, you're used to having your property with a colon followed by the value. And that works great for object literals. This is not an object literal. This is a class definition, and we have a bunch of fields defined. So even in regular JavaScript, if you had something that looked like this, that would make no sense to JavaScript when working with the class syntax. Nevertheless, because of the way our brains work, and we, we see these curly braces and start to think of this as an object literal, it's very possible that you'll come into here and start typing things like this. And you'll think that you're assigning the value 3 to ID, but you're not. You're actually trying to say the ID is of type 3, which it's not supposed to be, because there is no type 3. If we wanted to assign a value to this, we could come in and we could set it up like that and assign the value and give us some type of initial value. But notice there's an equal sign. And that's because this is not an object literal. This is a class definition, and we're defining our field here. So that's one of the things you'll get a little bit frustrated with when working with TypeScript initially is when working with some of the syntax that looks kind of similar to other stuff that you've, um, that you've worked with before in terms of working with JavaScript. So there's our widget TS class. So let's go ahead now and use this class to create a strongly typed application state. So I'm going to come over to my JS folder here, create a new file, and we'll say app-state.ts. So there's our app state. Now what we're going to do is we want to set this up to basically produce an interface which is going to define what our application state type is going to look like. To, to, to look like. When you typically work with React and Redux, or we'll just basically say Redux, Redux in JavaScript, you don't, you know, there's no strong typing of what your actual state object's going to look like. But when you work with Redux and TypeScript, you can actually make that state object have an actual strongly defined type. So we're going to come into here, and the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to um, import our widgets that we created from the, from the models there. So we'll say import widget from models slash widget. So if you come into here, you'll see we have our widget inside of models. And so our app state is referencing our models folder accessing widget. All right. Oh, by the way, you'll notice I have tslint running here. So take a look at this real quick. See the green underline? The reason that green underline is occurring is because of tslint. If you come down here in my uh, project configuration, you'll see I have a tslint json. And um, I have some default rules that are set up for actually linting my TypeScript code. This is actually really useful, and it works with um, Visual Studio Code, works with WebStorm, that kind of thing. So if I wanted to fix this and actually follow my rules, then I could come into here and put double quotes in, and now that satisfies my rules. All right. Now I want to go ahead and set up my interface for my app state. So I'm going to say export interface app state. 
And then on my app state here, I'm going to have widgets, and it's going to be of type widget, and it's going to be an array. Okay? All right. Now, oh, and can't forget the uh, semicolon there. Okay. So a couple of comments here about this. Import and export will be transpiled by TypeScript. However, import and export are actually part of ES2015. This is the ES2015 module syntax. And, and this syntax is not actually, at least the last time I checked, is not actually supported natively in any of the current JavaScript engines. So this is the one feature of ES2015 you absolutely have to use a transpiler for because none of the JavaScript engines actually understand it. Um, but if we come in here, we have our import and export, and that will actually be transpiled by TypeScript. And then we have interface. Now, JavaScript itself has no concept of interfaces, but TypeScript does. And so we're actually going to create an interface here called app state. Now, the cool thing is, is that when TypeScript does its type checking, it does it as part of the transpilation process. So when you create things like interfaces, which don't have any equivalent in JavaScript, Ultimately, when this gets transpiled, app state doesn't actually get transpiled out to the JavaScript itself. Our widget class over here will be transpiled out because that's actual JavaScript code. But the app state is only going to exist within the context of our TypeScript code and only used when actually doing the transpilation process. Okay? So later on, when you go to inspect your code, don't expect to find app state in any of your transpiled JavaScript code. It won't be there. Okay, so now that we've got that, we need to go in and update our Redux store so that it will actually use this app state type. So we're going to open up appstore.ts and we're going to come into here and we're going to set this up. So in order to do this, we need to first import store from Redux. Now, this store that we're importing, this is from Redux's TypeScript definitions, okay? Apply middleware and create store, those are just part of the regular Redux JavaScript library. But we can actually pull in the store here um, as well and bring in that TypeScript definition and then we can make use of it down here to create our store. Now, of course, in order to use our app state, we also have to import it. So we can say import app state from and then we'll do dot slash app dash state. Great. So there's our app state being imported. And now we can take app state, come down here, and set up our type to be store app state. So now what we've done is we've created a strongly typed, a strongly typed app store. All right. Now you can see it really wasn't that much work. You know, once we, of course, knew to import store and then actually pull in our state, actually pulling all of this in and then and setting up this type like this was actually pretty simple to do. We didn't have to go in and do a massive rewrite of our JavaScript code. We simply had to add in the colon and then the strong typing. And this will ensure then that our store is going to follow this typing. And when we reference that store in other pieces, places of our code, we'll get really good IntelliSense for what that store is capable of actually, um, actually doing. All right, cool. So the next step for setting this up is we're going to come over to do action types here. And actually, before we do that, let me double check our time here. Okay, we're at 33 after. Move this, we'll move this along a little bit quicker. So we have our action types here. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this up to actually be an enum. So here I just have simply an object literal with some properties and stuff. But we can convert this over to be an enum. And I'm going to say enum action types. I can get rid of the equal sign here. I'm then going to come in here and get, uh, get rid of the actual values being assigned. And boom, there's my enum. So now instead of creating a bunch of you know, objects that just have you know, some key value pairs to do enum type operations, I now have my enum set up here with my action types. And I can now use this enum throughout my actual application. So let's head up to our actions and let's update our actions now to be able to use the strong typing. The first thing we're going to have to do is actually import action from Redux itself. So we'll say import action from Redux. There we go. 
and we'll make our little linter happy there. All right, so we're going to import our action. Now, before we continue um, doing additional um, stuff with the actions, I do want to add something here to make fetch work. See fetch down here? Fetch is a new API. Um, it's not officially part of the standard yet um, for web browsers. But fetch is a new API for making um, basically asynchronous requests um, against uh, a REST service, GraphQL service, what have you, over HTTP. It's a replacement for the XHR object. And so we're using fetch down here. But unfortunately, our TypeScript doesn't know what fetch is. So we can come up here and we can say declare var fetch. And this will simply make TypeScript happy that fetch has been declared somewhere and then we can, we can make use of it. All right, so once we've done that, now we need to actually create our actual action type. So what's cool is instead of just having, um, you know, a bunch of action objects that, uh, that you know, are just loosely, loosely typed, the shape can change, we can actually have strongly typed action objects to make sure that we understand what properties are available on different types of actions. So we're going to come into here and we're going to say export interface widget action. And this is going to extend the action from Redux. There we go. So this action here is going to have a built-in type property on it, so we don't have to redefine that here in our interface. But we do need to add this widgets property to it. So we're going to come into here and say widgets. And we'll make this an array. And boom, now we have our interface defined. So the next thing we need to do is actually make our um, action methods here actually set them up so that they um, so that they are actually strongly typed as well. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to put a colon after this, and you'll notice for this one we don't actually pass in any parameters, which is good. But we do have an object that we're returning back, which is this widget action. So we can come in here and decorate this just like that, and there we go. So now we have a strongly typed method. And uh, we'll just come into here. And let's drop this down to the next line. There we go. So now everything's not on the same line. Or if you wanted to, you could put the type down onto the next line, that kind of thing. Now we need to do the actual, um, the actual done action and do the strong typing for it. It's going to be similar. So we can actually just copy this piece of code here. Paste that down there just like that. And let me move this over a little bit. Now here we actually have an input parameter that we're going to need to pass in. So we can take our widgets here and we can simply make this strongly typed. So there's our widget being passed in. And we'll once again come down here. All right, now we have our widget and then we can actually make this parameter strongly typed. Now, if you decide to make your parameter strongly typed, you have to go ahead and wrap it in the parentheses, even if you only have the one parameter. But we're going to come into here, and we'll say um, widget, and we'll make it an array, and there we go. So, hey, take a, take a look at that. We've got our actual uh, parameter strongly typed. We have our function definition strongly typed. So far, so good. Okay? All right. So the next thing we're going to move on to is we're going to move on to the reducer itself. So we'll come down here to the reducer, and we're going to open up our reducer file, and we're going to make our reducer strongly typed. So we'll come up to here. We're going to say import reducer from Redux, and then our reducer is going to need to know what our application state type is, so we'll have to import that as well. So we'll say import app state, and we'll say from, and then we'll do app dash state. And then we're going to come into here, and we'll take our reducer, and we'll simply say reducer app state. There we go. So now we have a strongly typed, um, a strongly typed reducer. All right. Now what's cool is, let's say we came down here to our action types. Take a look at our enum IntelliSense. Isn't that nice? 
When you start using TypeScript all over the place, you get really awesome IntelliSense like this. Um, that makes it really, really easy to, to, do your, to do your JavaScript coding and stuff. All right, so the next thing we need to do is we actually need to set this up so that our, um, our parameters here are also strongly typed. And I'm going to move this down to the next line there. And we'll come into here, and the first one is going to be our state. So we can simply say app state and give that a type. And then for our action here, we're also going to have widget action. Now, of course, we're going to have to import widget action to be able to use it. So we'll say import widget action from. And then we're going to go up a folder, actions, and then we call that refresh widgets. There we go. So now we have our strongly typed action. So if we come into here now and say action dot, you can see we get our widgets property there. So now the editor no longer has to like do a bunch of guessing, looking at all of our JavaScript files to try to figure out what it is we can use. Um, instead, now it can just rely upon those type definitions. And on a simple project like this, it might seem like a little bit of overkill, but I promise you on a large project, having this type of IntelliSense is incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. Okay, so that's our reducer. So the next step that we have to do, the final step, is really set up our components. So this is where we're going to start doing a little bit of, of TypeScript stuff with React itself. So over here I have a components folder. And the first thing I want to point out to you is you'll notice that our components don't end with a TS file extension. They end with a TSX file extension. This is a requirement for TypeScript. Whenever you utilize JSX inside of your TypeScript files, you have to end it with the, with the TSX instead of TS. But what's cool is TypeScript supports JSX out of the box. So, um, so you're not limited to just using Babel to do the transpiling. You can use TypeScript to transpile your, your JSX as well. So the first one we're going to do is widget table. So we'll open up widget table here. And uh, the first thing I want to point out to you is you're going to notice there's a red line under react.component. Well, this red line is basically telling us that react.component is a generic type and that we need to specify the type for our props as well as the type for our state. So one really cool thing about working with TypeScript is you get, you get all types of error messages and helps like this so that you know what you're supposed to be passing in and what you're supposed to be working with. So we're going to make a bunch of changes to this file to, um, to utilize some of the uh, ES2015 features or utilize some of the TypeScript features as well as ES2015, as well as do the TypeScript stuff with react.component. So, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an interface here for our props. So we have interface, widget, table, props. And and um, when you go to build these things, let's say you have an existing component and you're like, well, what should I make my interface be? You can actually come down and look at the prop types. Hopefully everybody uses prop types when creating React components. So you already know what the props should be. So now you can just take this information here and come up and make use of it up here. For example, I can say refresh widgets. And then I can come in here and I can just say function. All right, and towards the end, if we have some time, we can actually get more specific with that, and we can have a more specific function and, like, let's say, return a promise or something like that if we want to. Now, once we say refresh widgets, the next thing is we have to actually set up our widgets property. So this is going to be our array of widgets. There we go. Now, we have to take this widget table props, and we're going to come down to react.component, and we're going to pass that in as the first one. Now, this particular component doesn't have any state. So if we don't have any state, how can we pass in a state type if there isn't one? There's a couple ways to do this. The way I prefer to do it is I just pass in void. You could also pass in a um, pass in just an empty object as well and that will also work too. Um, but void seems to work fine for me, so that's typically what I put in there. You have to remember when this code when this code actually runs in the web browser, all of this stuff goes away. This is only for the purposes of doing the TypeScript compilation stuff. So really when we're adding all of this, we're not really actually changing the behavior or functionality of the actual end application. We're just configuring how the, the type checking mechanism is going to be 
looking for different things when, when doing the transpilation process. So there's our widget table props, and there's our component properly configured. But I want to come down here to prop types and default props. You might be looking at this thinking, this is kind of a, a weird syntax. Why does he have static get prop types as an actual getter function? You're probably used to seeing code when working with classes that might look more like this, where you have your prop types and then you assign a property like that. Setting up a static property here like this is the equivalent of this right here. This is basically underneath the hood, widget table is really just a function constructor for those of you who are into JavaScript. And static properties are nothing more than properties that are added directly onto the function constructor, which is what, which, which is, what is accomplished here. Well here, this is doing basically the same thing. The problem is, is like, I, like, like I mentioned at the outset of the coding demonstration, JavaScript really has no concept of defining a bunch of properties as part of the class definition. So the only way you can actually define what you might think of as a field or a static field is to actually make it an accessor property, which is kind of a pain. So we can use property declarations, which I think are actually going to be part of ES2017, but they're supported in TypeScript now. And we can actually modify this code and get rid of the get, change this to look like that, then come down here and get rid of the return statement. There we go. So now we have our prop types. I think it's complaining about my indentation. Oh, it's public on there too. Or public. There we go. All right. So we have our prop types here with our refresh widgets and our widgets. And now instead of having to do all that get accessor stuff, which is kind of a pain, we can actually assign the object like, 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 like we have here with our prop types. We can also do the same thing here with the default props. Now you'll notice I marked this as public. Um, React requires that these basically be public properties. And so we'll come down here and we'll say public. And we'll do de default props here. Say equal. Boom. We can get rid of the return statement, of course. And then have our assignment just like that. So that way we can actually define these within the class. We don't have have to have a bunch of code outside of our class declaration. Down here for render, it wants us to put public in front of it. For render, default props, all of those, those actually need to be, um, those actually need to be set up as, uh, as public methods. Uh, down here though, for our lifecycle method, we can actually come into here and we can make that private. So the lifecycle methods can be private, but the, um, but the actual render and stuff all need to be public. Uh, one last little thing, this little green, uh, underscore here, or green squiggly. It wants me to put a trailing comma. A trailing comma is a um, is a newer feature in in, uh, in JavaScript. I believe it's it's either ES twenty sixteen or ES twenty seventeen. And the trailing comma is a really a good practice to follow. I have my tslint file set up to require it. Basically, with the trailing comma, you don't have to modify this line because you add a new line here. All right. If you don't have the trailing comma, when you, do, when you do your edits, you have to come in here and modify this line to add the comma. And then when you look at your source code history, your commit history, it's going to show you two modified lines when really you were only trying to modify one line, which was adding this new one down here. So trailing commas are always a good practice to follow so that you can have more accurate, um, more accurate reports from your source control system about how many lines were really truly actually modified for a particular source code change. All right, so coming down here, we have our render, we have our widgets, and we have our refresh widgets. Now let's say I came into um, um, refresh widgets here and I typed in, I fat fingered uh, I, I have like a double I in there. Take a look at what you get here in the editor. You get this red squiggly. How cool is that? How many times have you worked on a JavaScript application and fat fingered something and JavaScript never complained about it in the editor, you ran your code, the whole thing crashed, you couldn't figure out why, you wasted half a day trying to figure it out, and it was just a, missed, it was just a typo. Well, TypeScript eliminates that. Now, because of the strong typing of our props, we get editor support for letting us know, hey, this is a problem. And of course, if it tried to actually compile, it would also fail as well. Up here, the same is true as well. If we were to, you know, fat finger widgets there, we would also get an error here. Now, take a look at our 
map function. So let's say I came into here and fat fingered the A for a name. Take a look at that strong typing. This is the real power of TypeScript. So yeah, it's a little bit more work to have to define these prop, you know, to define the props or the state and pass it into React.component, but ultimately it can save you a lot of time and frustration when actually building your application. So, so far so good there. We have one last file that we need to modify here. How are we doing on time? All right. One last file to modify. Um, for this, what we're going to do is we're going to just pull in the app state so we can have a strongly typed state. Now, can you go through and do strong typing for these other parts? Absolutely. But for the sake of time, we'll just put a strong typing on our state and we'll call it a day. So we're going to say import app state from, and we'll go app state here. And of course, because we're going to be using a, um, we're going to be using a type on this, we have to put our parentheses around state, and we'll say app state like that. Boom, so now we have our strong typing. Now the last step before we go to questions is we actually need to run this code and make sure it actually works. Uh, make sure I didn't make a typo somewhere. So we'll save this. I'm going to open up my terminal window here. And um, I'm just going to simply, in fact, I'll get a new terminal window. We'll say npm start. And this is just going to kick off my process behind the scenes. By the way, I'll give you the access to the, uh, the GitHub repo if you want to check out this source code later on. All right, let's take a look and see what failed here. Uh, let's see here. Ah, looks like we have a TypeScript error in app.ts. So let's go to app.ts and see what we made our mistake on. Let's see. Save that. That should all be cool. Line seven, which a table container. Ah, my problem is this. My file extension isn't TSX, it's TS. So in order for this to work, this has to have that TSS ex extension. Otherwise, it won't transpile it properly. So we'll say rename TSX. Now save it. Now run it again. Yes, it worked. So you can see there, we actually have our outputted information to the screen, and everything worked. Make sure when you do your JSX, make sure you put a TSX file extension. Now, um, one last thing I wanted to point out to you before we go to questions here is I'm going to go back to our, um, to our actual action here for refresh widgets. Down here, you're going to see where I'm returning back fetch. Okay. And um, what I want to do quickly is I want to show you where strong typing, one additional strong typing thing that's actually really, really cool. I'm going to take my widgets map, take this piece of code out of here, and I'm going to say const widget models, and we'll paste that in like that. So we're going to produce a bunch of widget models. And I'm going to take widget models here, pass that into here, and then what I'm going to do is simply return back widget models from my from my then function. Now, because I'm returning a promise from here, I can actually come over to my widget table TSX component, and down here, where I say refresh widgets, I can actually respond to this as a promise, get my widgets, which I returned back, and then say console, we'll just put it inside of a curly braces here. Console.log um, widgets. Now, all of this is fine for TypeScript purposes, this dot then. And that's because we simply declared this as a function. But let's say we had been more specific about declaring this, and we actually had it set up the original way that it was coded to basically return nothing. Okay? So the original way we had refresh widgets coded before we added this return statement 
was to basically return nothing. So if we go back over to our table here, we come down here, you're going to see that now the then function is complaining because there is no then that exists on void. So we could come up to here and we could actually modify this and actually tell it it's going to return a promise. And we can be more specific about what's going to be returned, but we have a problem. Our promise is a generic. We have to specify what the actual result of that promise resolution is going to be. So in this case, it's going to be an array of widgets. So we can specify our promise like that, then come down here, and we have really good strong typing. And what's cool about that is because we did the strong typing, if I say widgets zero, I now get my color, description, ID name, quantity, size, stuff like that. So you can see that when you, when you get really specific with the typings, you have a better, a better experience. Now, you can be more general if you want. I mean, honestly, you could make everything be of type any if you wanted to, but of course you'd get none of the benefits of TypeScript. And then you can be a little more specific, for example, with the function by saying the type is function, but then it'll kind of allow any function. Or you can get really specific like we did here, and then you get incredible IntelliSense. But it's all about how much strong typing you really want. If you want a lot, awesome. If not, that's fine too. It all depends upon what your project requirements are. Okay, so that kind of concludes our demonstration here. Um, it's uh, 56 after. I can hang around for a few minutes. Or, yeah, it's 56 after. I can hang around for a little longer if we need to to answer questions. Um, do we have any questions from anybody about any of this stuff? that we covered here in the, um, in, the, in the webinar. Let's see here, I've got a couple of questions. All right, so one of the questions is differences between TypeScript 2 and 1. Um, I have not sat down to try to examine the differences in terms of working with React and Redux between TypeScript 2 and 1. Um, when I first started doing my React Redux stuff with TypeScript, it was with version 1. Um, and then when version 2 came out, I just started using version 2. Um, um, but I have not sat down and tried to do um, any of the, uh, analyze any of the differences. All right. Are there any other questions? If you have questions, type them into the questions box. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, prerequisite for the upcoming training. Uh, basically, just have some, um, have some basic you know, web development experience. I'm not going to assume that you're a TypeScript expert. I'm not going to assume you're a JavaScript expert. We're going to be covering everything from the beginning. We'll start with literally React Hello World, and we're going to build an application over the two days from scratch. Um, employing React and Redux, obviously, and then, of course, doing all of that coding with TypeScript along the way. Any additional questions? All right. I'm going to come over here to back to our PowerPoint slide here real quick. And um, so if you want to go to the GitHub repo, you can access that with this link here. And I'm going to push up our changes from the demonstration right after the webinar is over. I'll push those up. You can pull down that code and take a look at it. Also, if you have any questions, you can always email me. And my email is eric at trainingfordevelopers.com. And you can actually uh, you can email me if you'd like if you have any questions about anything. I'm always happy to answer questions. And uh, for those of you who might be interested in the training, it'd be awesome to, um, to uh, have you be a part of that and, and work with you to learn more about React and Redux using TypeScript.
All right, do I have any other questions? All right, awesome. Thank you guys so much for, for dialing into the webinar. Hopefully everybody learned something new. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, don't hesitate to email me and uh, take care. Thanks.